Amazon's New York City headquarters is off. As we go to air, it looks as if the mega seller has pulled out of its plan to locate in New York. In a conversation recorded before that news broke, we looked at the resistance the plan had provoked and why, and consider how development might be possible without displacement. In this week's show, residents of Long Island City talk about their problems with Amazon, and we take a tour of the place with a Long Island preacher's son. That's this week on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. After months of aggressive competition among cities, the Amazon Corporation chose Long Island City in New York and Crystal City, Virginia for their new headquarters, HQ2. The announcement prompted a whole lot of talk about covert negotiating, public subsidies, and the potential displacement of immigrants and small businesses. At a city hall hearings in, in New York City in December, Amazon officials faced jeers of protest and even a banner drop. But taking on Amazon is not so easy for the simple reason that however much consumers fear it is stifling competition and reducing choice, they also love its cheap prices and convenience. So. What's next? Does a $1 trillion company actually have anything to fear? And if so, from whom? Joining me today are Maritza Silva Farrell, the executive director of Align, a labor and community alliance in New York City. Sasha Wijeratna, executive director of CAV, that's the Organizing Asian Communities Organization. And Julian Robinson of New Economy Project, which, like it sounds, is all about finding new and different ways for our city to develop. We could start anywhere with respect to the impact on housing, with respect to the impact on jobs, with respect to the impact on schools, the environment, you name it. Um, governance. Who wants to start? I, mean, I could start just giving the big picture in terms of like what kind of company Amazon is and really what that could potentially mean for our country. Uh, and I say the country because whatever Amazon does in New York City is really going to set out the standards as to how they expand. Uh, New York City is a city where we have fought companies like it, but we got to remember what happened with Walmart. Yep. When Walmart tried to open stores in New York City, we fought it. And? Community organizing happened. And, and they're not here. And just they finally got here somewhat with a different name, with e-commerce, right? So the threat that we have on e-commerce is huge. And the threat on our workers and how much the retail workers and warehouse workers will be impacted. Amazon is a huge company. At one point last year, it hit the $1 trillion mark, one of very, very few global corporations. And they have the nerve to come to New York and say, we want you guys to give us money to open up our stores here with the skills that they're going to be creating jobs. So they have this narrative. I do believe that the organizing that many groups and, uh, are doing is really important. We can never undermine the power of organizing. And I want to remember, folks, that this trickle-down economy, a uh, way of looking at the world, never works. Communities in, in New York fought back Walmart for a very long time uh, and won. Uh, could that happen? Do you think this is a done deal? What do you think, Sasha? I think it's definitely not a done deal. And I think that's what Amazon wants us to think. That's what the city and the state want us to think. And we can't buy into that. There is no guarantee that Amazon is going to come to New York City. And the best defense that we have against them coming to Queens, to New York, is to organize a mass base of frontline communities to say no. And that's what we're doing. How were those hearings at City Hall? You were there, I think. I was. To be honest, I only saw the very beginnings of the hearings because I was part of the banner drop, so I was very quickly escorted yes, out. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> so I will let someone else <laughs> speak to what else happened at the hearing. Julian? Um, I was just at the press conference before the hearings. I didn't make it inside because there were so many folks uh, packing uh, the crowd. That what, what kind of groups showed up? Oh, lots of organizing groups, uh, RWDSU, lots of labor groups, base building organizations, um, New Yorkers from all different parts of the city showed up to let Amazon know that this is A, not how the process should be done, uh, and B, this is not how we want economic development to look in New York City. Amazon is a $1 trillion company. Is that accurate? You're approximately valued at a trillion dollars? I think it's close to that, yeah. Close to that. So why should we give you this money? So these incentives, um, um, they're performance-based, which means that we will not receive any money until we create jobs and make these investments. But you're worth a trillion dollars. Why do you need our $3 billion and we have crumbling subways, crumbling public housing, people without health care, <laughs> public schools that are overcrowding? Why, why, do you need, why do you need our $3 billion? 
This project is going to provide over $186 billion in positive economic impact to the state over the next 25 years. That includes over $14 billion in additional tax payments. That to the state analysis was done by someone who was hired by the state of New York and not by neutral third party academics or companies that could provide that economic analysis. The, the, what you're citing was done by people who were hired to do that on behalf of this project. It wasn't done by a neutral third party. So why do you need our, if you're worth a trillion dollars, why do you need our $3 billion? We believe this project will be a positive economic impact for the city and the state. We're here to create jobs uh, in not only our 25,000 direct jobs, but the thousands of indirect jobs that will result from this. Would you be willing to go through ULERP? Not at this uh, process. I believe we are, uh, you know, we are proceeding with the GPP plan. So you're saying no to the community who you want to be neighbors with. You're saying no to the city council and the local city council member. You're saying no, you won't go through ULERP. I don't think that's an option at this time. It is an option. You're saying no to it. The mayor rightfully talks about ending the tale of two cities, yet he is cheerleading a backroom deal that literally pays Jeff Bezos to build his gleaming tower in the sky, while the residents of the Queensbridge houses, many of whom are freezing because of the lack of heat, can watch Amazon executives bypass the subways and land their corporate helicopter on a taxpayer-funded helipad. So is all of this discussion of Amazon coming to New York because of the high quality of education and the highly available um, resources in terms of technology, trained workers, is that just guff? I mean, who are they really here for? And what does the, what do we learn or what are we supposed to think about the fact that they're going to be bringing their business right next door to the nation's largest public housing? Uh, project, the Queensbridge Houses. Those two things, I mean, I raise a lot of flags for me. Who wants to address that? So when we're talking about the Amazon development and we're talking about how they came into the city, um, we're really looking at two diverging paths of what economic development could look like in New York. Right. Um, on one hand, we have an investment in, you know, a trillion dollar company, the world's richest man. And on the other hand, we have this amazing resource and wealth uh, in New York of New Yorkers organizing cooperative and community-led institutions. Um, we have uh, the resources that are the folks that live in the Queensbridge houses. We have uh, this am amazing wealth of resources of folks who live in Queens that are organizing worker cooperatives, that are organizing community land trusts. And the city and the state have an opportunity to invest in New Yorkers, and instead they've decided to pursue um, this other economic development mm -hmm. strategy where mega corporations are deciding what development looks like. Um, I mean, I think that we got the numbers, it was close to $1.5 billion that the city is paying, maybe the city and the state are ponying up together, uh, per, for just the job part of this. Yeah. It, it comes out to something like $48,000 mm -hmm. per job. Um, will those jobs go to any of the people in Queensbridge? Are those the people they're happy to be moving near to? Of course not. And people in Queensbridge know that. When we asked our members and our member leaders and even just people walking down the street, what do you think about these jobs? Are they going to come for you? They instantly said no. These are working class people. These are not, this is not who Amazon wants to hire. It's not who Amazon wants to be the face of the company, and it's a headquarters. It's not a warehouse. And so even these jobs that are so terrible, like it's not even those jobs that would right. go to and the And what about the construction? Would they get it's the construction jobs? Possibly, and that's temporary. And if you get a construction job and something comes up next to where you live, it's 7,000 people living in the Queensbridge houses and the value of that land skyrockets, all the grocery stores that you have access to are gone. Where you do your laundry, gone, right? All of these other services are not gonna be there and maybe, I mean, NYCHA's facing crisis as, as people public know. housing authority. And so there, I think folks are even worried that that land might become so valuable that NYCHA tries to sell it. And so what's the point in getting a job for a temporary amount of time if then you don't have a place to live? The other side of the argument, the story that has been told to a lot of people around the country and the city has been that this development will bring not just the jobs, but improvements to the subways. It will bring new infrastructure investment at the behest of Amazon, but it will benefit everybody. Are you against investment in the subways? I mean, investment on the subways is needed. 
we need investment today. We, we need it yesterday, actually, right. right? That is totally right. I don't think Amazon would want to invest in our communities. Amazon is the kind of company that thinks only about their bottom line. They've proved it everywhere in the country and in the globe. You know, you've seen the walkouts of workers, right? Walking out of their workplace uh, last year, those walkouts happen many, many times. That's one. Uh, and two, the investment needs to come actually from our government. Yeah. Our government needs to put in the money on the investment on subways. But isn't that transit. part of what they're saying? These public subsidies will be, will take the form yeah. of investing in transport and all the rest? Actually, council member and speaker of the, the city council, Corey Johnson, asked that question of Amazon and asked that question of the president of the EDC corporation, say basically like, would you prefer to give the money, this amount of money that we have to Amazon rather than giving to the public housing? Tell us how much public housing actually needs. Right, like those questions were asked at this past uh, public uh, hearing that they have. Um, and EDC, obviously, they think that the trickle-down economy model is a model that it works. Mm -hmm. They haven't learned their, learned their lessons. Corporations do not care about the people. We learn what happened in Detroit. Corporations leave vacant spaces. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to believe. And also, I would say one more care about some people. They care yeah. about their shareholders. Um, they yeah. have a job. I mean, I always think that we kind of vilify the corporation that is kind of doing its job, raising money for its shareholders. It's kind of up to the rest of us to organize to change that. Mm -hmm. um, who was it that said power concedes nothing without a demand? Would union organizing help? Would organizing to require that they actually abide by certain rules, regulations, make hard and fast agreements mm -hmm. um, with the city? Yes, I mean, I think yes, any kind of organizing helps. And I think it's important to hold on to the end goal is that Amazon doesn't set foot in Queens. So an, an organized base of workers in Amazon is an amazing victory and it doesn't change that the impact of Amazon in Queens is devastating. Mm -hmm. And there is no, there, there are no negotiations around that. There are no concessions around that. There's no other solution that lets Queens that lets people who are in Queens, have historically lived in Queens, not get displaced. Mm -hmm. And that keeps Queens as the immigrant and people of color borough that it is. And so, of course, there might be investments in the MTA in other things, but the question is then for who? And there's a long history of these agreements happening, these concessions being made, um, but the communities that have historically and systematically been excluded um, from these economic benefits continue to be excluded and continue to be displaced. Um, and it's a question of, as you, I think you were saying, that it's who has the levers of power? Are we giving the levers of power to Amazon and allowing them to make concessions on their deal? Um, when in reality, the power should be with New Yorkers. We should be making the decisions about what our neighborhoods look like, what our housing looks like, what our workplaces look like. We shouldn't be asking them to give us power back. Mm. It's our power in the first place. Well, let's talk about that power. And the other insidious part of it that I've been seeing is the relationship, the way that this deal has changed the relationship between New Yorkers and the city government. Mm -hmm. um, I read, as I was preparing for this segment about Basically, de Blasio has been caught in a lie when it comes to um, what was committed to with respect to alerting Amazon to public records requests um, were people to try to investigate more about these agreements. What do you understand about that? And what does it mean that government is being undermined by Amazon in a way and our faith in it? This is a progressive mayor, I should say, with a progressive majority on the city council. I mean, I think it goes back to these problems with the process. You know, it seems as though the mayor and the governor wanted this deal to be done. They have this idea of what economic development should look like, and they didn't feel as though New Yorkers should have as much of a say. Um, and that's, as you know, it's very problematic, it's very troubling. Um, and if we were to rebuild that trust, I think they need to pivot yeah. to this new vision of what economic development can be and look towards all of these groups that are really building community-led and cooperative institutions in their neighborhoods. I think if the mayor and the governor were to take that money, um, it's again an incredible amount of money, $3 billion with a B, um, and give it to communities and allow them to make their own decisions, I think very quickly New Yorkers would say, oh, okay, I can get behind this. You're trusting me. You're investing in me, a New Yorker, instead of Jeff Bezos and you know a mega corporation to make these decisions. I mean, $48,000 to 25,000 people living in Queens. What's your vision of what could be done with oh, that kind of money? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, if you talk to anyone in NYCHA, I think there's a vision around what public housing could actually look like, what housing could actually look like, and if we, we could actually own the land that we're on. I think there is this question of community control. What does it look like for communities to actually determine 
everything about our lives, our own education, our own healthcare, our own schools, our own housing, that housing is actually a human right that's not negotiable at all. I mean, there are so many different ways. Are you seeing people spend losing housing already, not in the public housing projects, but elsewhere? Are, are, are landlords already throwing people out, as it were? I mean, landlords are throwing people out all over New York, right? right? So, and that's the other question, sort of going back to the question around process, is that I think there are some New Yorkers who have never, where well, this mm -hmm. isn't surprising, yeah. right? I mean, residents in NYCHA have been lied to about repairs, about lead paint. I mean, it's not surprising to them. This is just a continuation of a long pattern. Even thinking about process, you know, we work with folks in Queens and Queensbridge. We also work with people in Chinatown. And there was just a major development that went through all the right processes and that still got approved, despite very clear stance by community that we don't want that there. And so even with the process, people still get displaced. Is there any place doing this right, going back to your victorious fight against Walmart? Is there a model of taking a different direction? I mean, when we fought Walmart, we fought them, and then we were able to put a grocery store that was unionized in the same location. So if you go back to that store and you talk to the workers, the workers are really happy, right? Like the workers talk about the benefits that they have, the hours of their work, um, and we prevent that from happening. So there are some success stories. Um, but one thing that I want to go back to is about this concept of progressive mayor and progressive governor. A progressive mayor and a progressive governor does not give away $3 billion to a company when you stay and your city is uh, in crisis, in housing crisis, uh, transit crisis, education crisis. So I just want to go... you certainly don't do it behind closed doors. <laughs> and you don't do it behind closed doors. The transparency piece is really important to highlight that. And the other thing that I think is very important, um, it's specifically how are we envisioning our city and our state, mm -hmm. right? Like, what do we actually want? And I agree, like, investment in our communities is right. We need to have worker cooperatives. We need to ensure that workers have a right to be able to organize. Amazon actually said it. Mm -hmm. Somehow, at the hearing, they think, oh, yeah, we will let workers organize if they want to. And a worker who was sitting right next to me at the hearing, <laughs> he laughed. <laughs> He's like, really? I just got fired. <laughs> I just got fired. So that's the kind of company. I just want each of you to give people a sense of what they can do to get involved. If they want to either find out more or, or get active, um, what can they do? Well, there is a lot that can be done. So the governor and the mayor bypass many of the laws, um, and there are a lot of elected officials in the city and the state, the state assembly and the, state, the senators, need to actually hold their power. They cannot allow for the governor to just make decisions for us, uh, and that's accountability. Mm. Similarly with the city council. City council is asking the right questions. They have asked the right questions. There will be a series of hearings where we have to actually hold not only Amazon accountable, but also also to other elected officials. So that will be a way to just mobilize, be on the ground, and just don't let Amazon to come in. Thanks, Maritza. Sasha? Yeah, I would say follow the lead of public housing residents, of working class communities in Queens, and especially if you live in Queens, start organizing your own neighborhood. The only thing that's going to stop Amazon is a mass base of people in Queens and across the city saying, we don't want this. So wherever you are, wherever you live, start talking to your neighbors, start talking to your friends, to your family, start organizing your community to join this fight. As the great um, Irish socialist uh, <laughs> Connolly said, the only secure community is an organized community. Mm -hmm. Julie? I mean, in addition to these things, I think a big thing is organizing and building on this incredible amount of momentum for the cooperative economy. Mm -hmm. um, you have the community land trust movement in New York growing. I mean, there's 13 groups around the city that are building on that momentum to take land out of the speculative market so that if Amazon, you know, however it does come in, or if any corporation comes in, folks won't be displaced. You have, you know, the worker co-op movement, the, the food co-op movement, the financial cooperative movement growing in New York City, and these are all building towards a new vision of economic development. And if that can build power um, and show that there's another path forward, then, you know, maybe we won't need Amazon to come in. Well, we certainly don't need Amazon to come in. Maybe <laughs> that argument won't even be able to be on the table. I, I completely agree. I think in order to have change, you have to imagine change. We imagine it, but we can also see it out right. there in lots of places. So thank you both. Oh, thank all three of you for coming in. It's been a great pleasure to talk with you. Keep up the great work. Thank you. thank you. You can find out more about all the organizations who are involved in this campaign and get more information about what's happening here in New York and around the country vis-a-vis -vis Amazon at our website. That's thelauraflandesshow.org. Thanks.
Long Island City is not a blank slate for developers. As we saw on a visit this January, it's a city with a people and a history all its own. What would development look like if the place and its people were given as much care as a visiting corporation? That's the question posed by Bishop Mitchell G. Taylor, a Long Island City son. The same care that we take in making a plan to accommodate the richest, largest company in the world coming to New York City less than a half mile away from the largest public housing development in the world needs to go into the capital repair deficit that exists just a half mile away. Hey man, you all right? All right. Good, good. My name is Bishop Mitchell G. Taylor. I live in Long Island City and have been since 1966. My exposure to Long Island City was because of my dad, Bishop Moses Taylor, who they named a street after him just a block away from here. My dad had an interesting love for Long Island City. He started his church in Long Island City in 1961. My whole association with people and Long Island City was the housing developments, because all the members of my dad's church came from the housing developments. We're at the corner of Queensbridge Houses. Remember, Queensbridge is the largest public housing development in the country, 96 buildings, six block radius, 3,142 apartments, 8,000 people are on the lease, potentially 16,000 people live here. This is Queensbridge. This is us. Probably if you were somewhere else, people would immediately say to you, the gentrification train has come. But in public housing, we have a very unique opportunity. I'll tell you why. Because in a sense, we're living in a protected community. My thought is that as we see Long Island City developing, that creates entrepreneurial opportunities for folks that need a little push, just a little technical assistance in you know, putting their business plan, putting their business in place. When there's new development, new people, new opportunities, all kinds of opportunities present themselves to you. Now, here we have another mammoth opportunity, and that's Amazon. I'm not saying that Amazon should solve the city's problems, but the point is, Something like this coming to our neighborhood, there should be some residual, at the very least, benefit from them being here. So this is the center of hope here. And if we can get inside here. One, one of our models here at the center of hope is that there's no hope like hope at the center. And the second part of that is, you may not belong to the center of hope, but the center of hope belongs to you. And so we have always been a church that focused on the socioeconomic condition of folks in our neighborhoods. You know, not, I mean, you know, it, yes, it's about spiritual things, connecting to God, but you know, also hey, you connecting to God alone is not a guarantee for personal success or wealth building or living life good. My whole thought in, you know, bringing this focus to public housing was that no one was talking about it. No one cared about residents that live in public housing and the challenges that they faced. And we realized that one church couldn't solve the mammoth problems that existed in public housing. So we wanted to create an alliance so we can change the historic pattern of dealing with poverty, which was usually from the outside in. We wanted to change that dynamic and do it from the inside out. And not from the top down, but from the bottom up. And that's what we did. This is a part of our Youth Career Pathway Center. Hey, hey how you doing? Good, how are you? Excellent, excellent. How's everything? You all right? Good. Excellent, great. excellent, 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 excellent. What's happening back here right now? So it's a workshop where you're trying to see how well you're able to market yourself. You gave Good. my elevator pitch just now, I told them. I'm Derek Willis, I'm the youth renter here for Urban Upbound. My job is to sit down and help our participants get on the path that they see themselves growing up. My man. Derek is also a part of Inside Track Public Relations Company as well. He's an expert web designer, so he does all our web work. Great guy. 
Why did I create Urban Outbound? Because I wanted to create a ladder for people to get out of poverty. I wanted, I wanted them to stop waiting for someone to do something for them and do something for themselves. And I realized if one, if one voice spoke, it could easily be ignored. But if a thousand voices spoke, it could never be ignored. And so we built employment center, we built entrepreneurial <laughs> development centers, we built cooperative business development centers. We have technical uh, business assistants here on, on uh, the Long City campus. Uh, we have one-on-one -on -one financial counseling. We have youth development, both academic and vocational. And we own our own bank, the Urban Upbound Federal Credit Union. So it's the ideology, the thought that we're taking those steps. Because my dad said to me, you want to make change? You got to own money. How do you own money? Open your own bank. If the state, the city, and Amazon do those collaborative things through public and private partnerships, I think that will change the city and the opportunity and access for residents exponentially like we've never seen before. My greatest hope that residents of Long Island City would be connected to the new economy and not be left out.